everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're going to talk about the Joseph Smith prophecy about the Constitution hanging by a thread and then the church coming in to save it. Um, this is something that I've heard probably my entire life, not really knowing where it came from or where you could find it or um, if it was valid or just, you know, the context behind it and all this stuff but a lot of people being really passionate about it. And so I want to thank Jason, who sent me a, a message um, on Instagram. And, and everyone that sent me messages, I'm sorry. I, just like emails, I, I'm trying to get through them. There are billions of them. And uh, you'll just have to forgive me. And don't expect me to respond back because it just, it frankly, may not be possible. But I'm going to do my best. Anyway, uh, Jason sent me a message saying, Jared, have you ever done a YouTube video on the Constitution hanging by a thread? And this is something that has kind of been on the back burner. Even uh, from the time that I started this channel, I was, it was kind of on my radar, but just on the back burner. But now is that time, thanks to Jason. So before we get into that, uh, here's the update on the Book of Mormon sharing challenge or the hashtag flood the earth challenge. Uh, 5,421 copies of the Book of Mormon that have been shared. So we're getting really close to 5,500. And uh, once we reach, reach that 5,500 mark, that's when we'll do um, a mark. We'll we'll mark it like we did when we hit 5,000. This purple, we'll color in the cell with this purple color. Uh, we have a new report of somebody me meeting with the missionaries. So that brings us to 42. So good job on that. And then... Uh, since the last time I updated this, which was a couple days ago, we've had six more people that have shared the Book of Mormon. Whenever you share the Book of Mormon, uh, let me know. Keep the message very short. Uh, put hashtag flood so it's easy for me to find. And um, just share it. Share it any way you want. But use, you can use the library or the Gospel Library app, go to Scriptures, there's a share button at the top, click on the share button, and then you can text it, email it, or you can send it via direct message in some social media app, however you want to do it. But good job, everybody. Okay, so uh, we're going to be looking at the Joseph Smith papers. This is a, a church, this is part of the church archives, essentially. And uh, I'm so glad that they're doing this because it's bringing to light so many things <laughs> where it's to where you can go to the, the primary source of uh, this information that's just been floating around in the church. And um, this is where you can actually see it, where it comes from. And to me, that's very valuable. And hopefully it is to you, too. Uh, don't just... You always want to take something to its original source as far as you can possibly go. Um, whenever you're basing your beliefs off of something, it's like, what? why do I believe that? Where did that come from? Take it down to the original source. That's what we should do. Now, uh, before we jump into actually reading this, um, I just want to bring up a couple ideas, or at least one idea. I don't know necessarily the fulfillment of this prophecy, what it's supposed to look like, like if it's, you know, certain parts of the Constitution that are being trampled on, if it's the entire thing, if it, yeah, I, I have no idea. But one thing that comes to mind is all the talk about religious freedom lately in the church. And uh, you can see here, um, it's there's been an uptick. Like when you go back in time, you know, it comes up from time to time. You know, it's, it's kind of sporadic. But within the last few years, probably from 2015 until now, uh, it's come up a number of times in General Conference and uh, four times altogether uh, in 2022 between those two General Conferences. And I'm not going to know about 2023 until they update the, the Scripture Citation Index with this most recent General Conference. Once that happens, I'll update all of these and we'll go over this entire spreadsheet. So could it be talking about religious freedom? Could it be broader than that? Uh, if you guys have any additional information, feel free to send it my way. Uh, this is going to be kind of like an initial video where we just kind of look at the sources, uh, where this comes from, the context. Uh, also something that Brigham Young said. Also something that President Oak said. But this will probably be an ongoing 
project to find out more about this and study more about what's been said about the Constitution. Okay, so, um, so this is what I did. I went to the Joseph Smith papers, and on the homepage, you can, there's like a search uh, bar where you can search things. And I, I just searched thread, and it came up with this. And uh, I want to, uh, there's going to be a lot of reading, but th there's going to be a lot of really good information. Um, something that actually, there's something that comes up that has to do with a completely different topic, which I'm glad that I found it by looking at this. But, okay, here we go. So, Here's where the story begins, okay? This is from Joseph Smith's journal, December 1842 to June 1844, okay? Uh, it says, so this is Saturday, May 6th, 1843. Morning had an interview with a lecturer on mesmerism, phrenology, objected to his performing in the city, Interview with a Methodist minister about his God of no body or parts uh, at 9.30 a.m. Mounted with staff, band and about 12 ladies, led by Emma, and proceeded to the general parade of the Legion east of my farm on the prairie, and had a good day of it except very high wind. Okay, so the prophet was bothered by that wind on that day. Marched the Legion down Main Street and disbanded about 2 o'clock uh, p.m. After a short speech on the prairie, uh, there were two United States officers present and General Ezekiel Swayze from Iowa. In my remark, uh, told the Legion, when we have petitioned those in power for assistance, they have always told us they had no power to help us damn such power <laughs> when they when they gave me when they give me power to protect the innocent uh, i will never say i can do no i can do nothing i will exercise that power for their good so help me god okay so th th okay now you see this like footnote right here footnote 396 and this is what it says okay james burgess recalled that Joseph Smith also spoke, quote, upon the Constitution and government of the United States, stating that the time would come when the Constitution and government would hang by a brittle thread and would be ready to fall into the into other hands, but this people, the Latter-day Saints, will step forth and save it. Okay, so this is the first thing I came across. It's from the Journal of James Burgess. And I put it on, okay, so this is on my uh, quotes A through Z spreadsheet. And it's actually this one right here, okay, what we just read. Let's read it one more time. James Burgess recalled that Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith spoke upon, or also spoke, quote, upon the Constitution and government of the United States, stating that the time would come when the Constitution and government would hang by a brittle thread and would be ready to fall into other hands, but this people, the Latter-day Saints, will step forth and save it. Okay, so uh, as, as far as I know, that hasn't happened. Um, if Again, if you have any information, anything that you like to share, feel free to send it to me, preferably by email uh, and with sources. Don't just say things. Send sources if you can. Okay, so there's that. And um, I can't really go beyond that because I went to the actual uh, Burgess Journal uh, in the church archives, and if I was to try... <laughs> If I was trying to like write it all down, it'd be really hard because of the handwriting, and I'm not so sure that there'd be anything else, but I, I, might, I might look into that in the future. Okay, so that was the first thing. But even more comprehensive than that, uh, when you scroll down, it says here, Martha Jane Knowlton Carre recorded a comparable statement from a sermon Joseph Smith delivered on the 19th of July, 1840. Okay, so he's said this twice and uh, like three years apart. So this was the most recent one, but now we're going to go back 
to 19th of July, 1840, and see what Martha J. Knowlton Carre recorded uh, in her journal. Um, there is a couple things to note about her and uh, in this recording. So uh, you'll notice that there's this third reference here, uh, Jesse Joseph Smith's 19 July 1840 discourse. I clicked on this link, which takes you to BYU Studies uh, 19, number 3. So I guess volume 19, number 3, which takes you here. Okay, here it is. And then you click on the PDF. That brings you here. Okay, by Dean C. Jesse. An occasional theme among Latter-day Saints during times of political crisis has been the prediction attributed to Joseph Smith that the U.S. Constitution would one day hang by a thread and that the elders of the church would at some critical juncture be instrumental in saving it. The source of this statement is thought to be uh, an unpublished address titled, quote, A Few Items from a Discourse Delivered by Joseph Smith, July 19th, 1840 filed uh, in the Joseph Smith Papers in the LDS Church Archives. Written neatly on 8 by 8 inch by 12 inch paper, the, the document is obviously a copy uh, since it shows none of the usual characteristics of an original report. The, papers, the paper appears to be of post-Nauvoo vintage and the handwriting does not correspond to that of any of Joseph Smith's known, known clerks nor is there a reference in the prophet's history to his having delivered a discourse on the 19th of July, 1840. Furthermore, at two points in the text, there appears to be a serious problem of continuity, suggesting copyist errors or some other flaw in the manuscript. Consequently, in the absence of an original text and without information about its origin and authorship, the reliability of this document has remained somewhat tenuous. Now, Okay, so that was like the, the, the first document that they had, but look at this. Now, the recent resurfacing of the original manuscript uh, from which the foregoing copy was taken, not only, so now we have the actual thing. That's what we're, that's what we're looking at uh, right here. This is the actual thing right here. Um, now, the recent surfacing of the original manuscript from which the foregoing copy was taken not only gives some clarification to the question of reliability, but also emphasizes to students of history the value of tracing one information to original sources. The 1840 Joseph Smith Discourse is one of four reported, reported longhand in a small notebook uh, in the writing of Martha Jane Knowlton and Howard Curray. Oh, and Howard Curry. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's her husband because it's Martha Jane Knowlton Curry. That's like her married name, I believe. Uh, Martha Jane Knowlton was living with her family in Hancock County, Illinois. That's the county of Nauvoo, if you didn't know, where the Latter day Saints began moving there in 1839. She was baptized in January 1840, and according to one account, was so convinced of Joseph Smith's divine calling that she recorded every discourse she heard him deliver. Now, I want to stop there and say, good job to you. Uh, what's your, your name again? Martha. And uh, let this be a lesson to all of us that, again, to, to consecrate your time and talents and your resources to the church it doesn't know it doesn't always have to be that you have some special skill or talent or whatever you just you do something useful and she did something very useful for all of us by writing this down have, like acting on her really strong testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith that he was a true prophet and uh thankfully she did this so think about the things that you can do and uh do it because it'll probably benefit somebody somewhere down the line. Okay, the church historian George A. Smith, uh, by the way, not to be confused with George Albert Smith, uh, this is a separate person, noted that she was more diligent in preserving the prophet's sayings than any other woman in the church. Martha Jane was 19 and still single when she recorded the 1840 Joseph Smith address as the first item in her little notebook. 
But after her marriage to Howard Carey in 1841, she continued to use the, the book for the same purpose. 19 years old, would you have been that diligent to try and copy down word for word um, the prophet's uh, discourses and addresses? Okay, since by 1840 there was not yet a procedure in the church for systematically reporting all of Joseph Smith's speeches, many of his addresses were never recorded, and others were preserved only unofficially in the personal writings of lay members, as was the case with with um, Martha. In addition, the longhand reports recorded at the time were subject to inherent limitations because of the absence among church members of sufficiently developed shorthand skills to permit verbatim reporting during Joseph Smith's lifetime. This accounts for the, the existence of some reports of Joseph Smith's speeches that are not referred to in the prophet's history. The Martha Jane Knowlton report of July 1840 is of this genre. A comparison of the Knowlton original with the copy in the Joseph Smith papers shows that the loose pages in the original were copied out of sequence, placing one portion of the discourse out of context and transferring a segment of a later discourse into the text of the July 1840 address. Hence, copies made from later source are inaccurate. The July 1840 context suggests that Joseph Smith's comments about the U.S. Constitution were given not long after his return from Washington, D.C., where his appeal for redress for the wrongs heaped upon his people in Missouri had fallen upon deaf ears. The address also gives significant insight into the marvelous anticipations and hopes the prophet had for Nauvoo in its beginning phase, but as one looks at the city from a later perspective, it is evident that the prophecies about Nauvoo, like Jackson County before it, were contingent upon human conditions and failings. So you're about to see that he makes a prediction about Nauvoo, and uh, it hasn't happened, but it's probably the same situation as um, New Jerusalem, the center place in Jackson County, Missouri, that uh, it didn't come to fruition because at that time, human conditions, failings, unworthiness, what, whatever the case may be, right? Um, as far as the whole thing about saving the Constitution, I, I don't know if that's still in effect. It very well could be. I'm not holding on to it too tightly. Like, I'm not going to like be like, well, we haven't seen the Constitution be saved yet, so we know that the Second Coming can't happen yet. Or... Uh, it could be that it's still this hasn't happened yet, but it's going to take place in a way different from what you might think. You know, for all I know, uh, maybe it's going to be the second coming itself that saves the Constitution. Because again, when we when we studied the Council of Fifty, they were drafting a Constitution for the millennial world, for the for the political kingdom of Christ. They were drafting a Constitution. And so for all I know, maybe that is the way in which the U.S. Constitution would have been saved, because it would have the same principles, maybe even better principles, I don't know, and then that would be used. Um, so there's a lot of like, different things to think about. In other words, there's a lot of different things to think about. Okay, so uh, now here is the original uh, if I'm understanding right, this right here that you see, this is the actual original. I don't think that this is the copy. Uh, so I think they updated it. I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. But I want to read the source note, or at least part of it, because there was uh, some interesting things here. So the timing of John Smith, uh, a point... The t okay, the timing of John Smith's appointment as presiding elder in Macedonia, an event referred to in the notebook, and eternal dating suggests that Correy made the entries in the notebook sometime between 1843 and 1855. The first date listed in the notebook is the 8th of August, 1853, and the last recorded date 
is the 1st of December, 1854. The notebook contains diary entries, financial statements, school notes, a copy of Curé's Patriarchal Blessing, and transcripts of three sermons given by Joseph Smith in Nauvoo, Illinois. Presumably, Curé maintained ownership of the notebook until her death in 1881. The book likely remained in the possession of the Curé family, until at least July 1902. Historians later discovered the book filed among the Joseph, the Joseph F. Smith papers in the Historical Department of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, suggesting that the Curry family placed the notebook in Smith's custody sometime prior to his death in 1918. So, and again, good job to the family for not just like, you know... <laughs> throwing it in the garbage, uh, putting it out in a, in a yard sale or, um, you know, or just leaving it where it was and collecting dust, you know, I don't know. Okay. That was the featured version copied in. Oh, so maybe this is the, co I don't know. Uh, handwritings of Martha. What? I don't know. I'm not really understanding that part, but it doesn't matter. Um, here is what it says. Okay. I'm going to go over one. Okay. Now, all the, like, the spelling errors and uh, stuff like that, that's not mine. I just copied and pasted it. I also did the little uh, strike through uh, wherever that that was in the journal because you, you'll see it here when you're looking at the the joseph smith papers they'll they'll write it down the way that it was in the journal including where uh, the person crosses out a word and stuff and uh, there's a lot of misspellings and stuff like that so just keep that in mind if you're following along okay a few items from a discourse delivered by joseph smith the 19th of july 1840 read a chapter in ezekiel concluding with this saying and when all these things come to pass and lo they will come then shall you know that a prophet hath been among you afterwards read the parable of the 12 olive trees and by the way that's found in dnc 101 afterwards read the parable of the 12 olive trees and said speaking of the land zion it consists of all north and south america but that any place where the saints gather is Zion. There you go. It, this is this is from Joseph Smith himself saying that any place that the saints gather is Zion. Opposed to this idea that the only place where Zion is, is Jackson County, Missouri. Um, again, it will be built at some point. The center place will be built, but not everybody is called to gather there. It's not a gathering place for the entire church. It was at the time of Joseph Smith because the church was tiny. But he's saying here, any place where the saints gather is Zion, which every righteous man will build up for a place of safety for his children. See? Safety, Zion, it's any place where the saints gather. It's not just the, the New Jerusalem and Independence Music, Missouri. The olive trees are 12 stakes that are yet to be built, uh, not the temple in Jackson, as some suppose. Uh, for while the 12 stakes are being built, we will have, we will be at peace, but the nations of the earth will be at war. And uh, I think that that's definitely been happening. The reason why is because uh, you can uh, put it down on a timeline. Let me zoom out. Let's go back to the time of Joseph Smith. Okay, let's just go like this. Gordon B. Hinckley, David O. McKay, Heber J. Grant, Brigham Young. Uh, just remember what Joseph Smith prophesied, that the uh, Civil War is what, would, is what would initiate, essentially, war being poured out upon the entire world, right? In fact, I think I have that somewhere here. I don't know. I'm not going to take the time to look for it. But, okay, so during the life of Joseph Smith, you have all these different wars. Um, 
War of Greek Independence, Padre War, Nanning War, Cape Frontier Wars in South Africa, uh, Mexican-American War. Now at this point we're with uh, Brigham Young. The Civil War still hasn't happened yet. Crimean War, Bleeding Kansas, which was like a... I mean, it was a war, but anyway. Um, okay, now here's the, the American Civil War. And then after that, immediately after that, you have the Seven Weeks War, Paraguay, Ceylon, Ceylon Gore, Civil War, the Cape Frontier Wars are still going on, Franco-Prussian War, uh, Red River Indian War, Serbo-Turkish War, Turco, <laughs> Russo-Turkish War, Anglo-Zulu War, Nitrate War, which was in South America, by the way, a place that you don't typically think of as a place of war, but there have been wars there. Uh, gun War, Sino-French War, which is like China in France, uh, Serbo-Bulgarian War, First Sino-Japanese War, Spanish-American War, Anglo-Boer War, Boxer Rebellion, Philippine-American War, The War of a Thousand Days, Moro, Moro Wars, Russo-Japanese War, Pig War, Italo-Turkish War, First Balkan War, uh, Mexican Revolution, Second Balkan War, <clears throat> World War I, Russian Revolution, Baltic War of Liberation, Russo-Polish War, Chaco War, Italo-Ethiopian War, Spanish Civil War, uh, Second Sino-Japanese War, World War II, Russo-Finnish War, Greek Civil War, Cold War, Israel War of Independence, Israeli War of Independence, Korean War, Algerian War, Suez Canal, Sinai War, Vietnam War, Six Day War, War of Attrition, uh, that's in, you know, has to do with Israel, Football War, <laughs> It was a South American one or a Central American one. Yom Kippur War, Dirty War, Soviet-Afghanistan War, Iran-Iraq War, First Lebanon War, Gulf War, Croatian War of Independence, Ten-Day War, Bosnian War, First Congo War, Kosovo War, Second Congo War, Afghanistan War, Iraq War, Second Lebanon War, Arab Spring, which wasn't really a well, it kind of resulted in war, uh, the Syrian Civil War, and then most recently the Ukraine War, um, and then things are kind of heating up in the Middle East, but we'll see what happens. Uh, there was actually a ceasefire. If you watch that live stream, there's been a ceasefire. So things have kind of calmed down, but we'll see if that holds. Okay, so uh, going back to this. <clears throat> All right, so look. The olive trees are 12 stakes, which are yet to be built. Not the temple in Jackson, as some suppose. For while the 12 stakes are being built... We will be at peace, but the nations of the earth will be at war. Our cry from the first has been for peace. I need to delete some of these numbers because they're the like the footnotes. There's another one up here. It's going to bother me until I find it. <sighs> Freaking A. Okay, that's fine. And we will continue pleading like the widow at the feet of the unjust judge. But we may plead at the feet of the magistrates, and at the feet of judges, at the feet of governors, and at the feet of senators, and at the feet of presidents for eight years. It'll be of no avail. We shall find no favor in any of the courts of this government. The redemption of Zion is the redemption of all North and South America. This is, this is another thing that I think people misunderstand. They think that the redemption of Zion is, again, specifically Independence, Missouri, being turned into the New Jerusalem. But Joseph Smith is saying the redemption of Zion is the redemption of all North and South America. And again, let's go to our meeting house, locator, LDS. Let's look at the map. 
and let's take a look at North America and South America. To me, it's looking pretty redeemed. Of course, there could be a ton more of these red dots. All of these are meeting houses, and each meeting house most likely, well, most of these uh, red dots probably represent at least a couple wards. Not all, but like in, in my ward is just it's just us. It's just one ward. Um, okay. So the redemption of Zion is the redemption of all North and South America. And those 12 stakes must be built up before the redemption of Zion can take place. And those who refuse to gather and build when they are commanded to do so cease to be saviors of men and are thenceforth are thenceforth good for nothing, but shall be cast out and trodden under feet of men for their transgression, as Reed Peck was when he when he applied in the name of an apostate for business in a store in Quincy. They told him that they wanted no apostates round them and showed him the door. <laughs> At this same st- <laughs> We don't serve them their kind here. Who what? Your apostates, they're going to have to wait outside. <laughs> Sorry, that's a Star Wars reference. Uh, at this time, at, at this same store, the authorities of this church could have obtained almost any amount of credit uh, they could have asked. We shall build the Zion of the Lord in peace until the servants of that Lord shall begin to lay the foundation of a great and high watchtower. And then shall they begin to say within themselves, what need hath my Lord of this tower, seeing this is a life, is a time of peace? I'm going to fix that right there. Okay. Then the enemy shall come as a thief in the night and scatter the servants abroad. When the seed of these olive trees are scattered abroad, they will wake up the nations of the whole earth. Even this nation will be on the verge of crumbling to pieces and tumbling to the ground. And when the Constitution is upon the brink of ruin, this people will be the staff upon which the nation shall lean, and they shall bear the Constitution away from the very verge of destruction. Okay, so has this in some way happened yet? Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. Does it have to do with religious freedom? I don't know. Does it have to do with the second coming and the establishing of of Christ's kingdom and constitution and um, building upon the American constitution. I, I don't know. I don't know. Let's continue. Then shall the Lord say, go tell all my servants who are the strength of mine house, my young men in middle aged, come to the land of my vineyard and fight the battle of the Lord. Then the Kings and Queens shall come. Then the rulers of the earth shall come. Then shall all saints come. Yea, the foreign saints shall come to fight for the land of my vineyard, for in this thing shall be their safety. And they will have no power to choose but what will come as a man fleeth from sudden destruction. But before this, the time shall be... uh, uh, Okay. But before this, the time shall be... These who are now my friends shall become my enemies and shall seek to take my life. And there are those now before me who will... Who will, uh, who will more fur- fur- furiously pursue me and more diligently seek my my life, and be more bloodthirsty upon my track than ever were the Missouri mobbers uh, you say among yourselves as as did them of old time. It is I, and it is I. But I know these things by the visions of the Almighty. So, you know he. It seems like he's talking a lot about a lot of different things here. It, it seems like he's talking. Okay, what's the date? Okay, July nineteenth, eighteen forty. Okay, when were the? Okay, when? No, when was Zion's camp? Uh, from May to June, 
1834, approximately 230 men, women, and children marched to Missouri to help the Saints who had been expelled from Jackson County, Missouri. The previous year, uh, this, this expedition, known today as Zion's Camp, was initially called the Camp of Israel. Okay, so this was long after that, like six years later. So I don't know if he is still kind of like talking about uh, gathering up the forces again to try and go take it back. Uh, I don't know. Let's, let's read it again. Then the kings and queens shall come. Then the rulers of the earth shall come. Then shall all saints come. Yea, the foreign saints shall come to fight for the land of my vineyard. For in this thing shall be their safety, and they will have no power to choose, but but will come as a free man fleeth from a sudden destruction. I, I don't know. But brethren, come ye, yea, come all of you who can come and go to with your mites and build up the cities, plural, of the Lord. And whoever will let him come and partake of the poverty of, of Navu freely for those who partake of her poverty shall also partake of her prosperity. And it is now wisdom in God that we should enter into as, as compact a city as possible for Zion and Jerusalem must both be built up before this, the coming of Christ. How long will it take to do to do this? Ten years? Yes. More than 40 years will pass before this work will be accomplished. And when these cities are built, then shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, so we, we're well past that time. It's been more than 40 years since he said this. And again, um, I'm not so sure, based on everything that we've read, that the actual city with like roads and houses and all that will be built before Christ comes. Although, like we've said, the temple, or at least one of the 24 temples, Independence Visitor Center LDS LDS has been built. And there's a stake right next to it. And again, we've talked about the fact that the original plans uh, for independence is that it was it was a stake. It was the center stake. So you have the people, okay, and you have the temple right here. Not turned into a temple yet, but it is there. So as far as like building up the city, I think that it's been started and it's probably sufficient to fulfill that prophecy. That's just my own opinion. I, uh, like I said, I don't think that everyone is going to be coming to New Jerusalem right here for protection, because Joseph Smith himself said that wherever the saints are is Zion, and it's a place for protection. And more importantly, that's what has been stressed recently, the most recent uh, of which was David A. Bednar um, in his his uh, YouTube video on the Church News YouTube channel. Uh, I think it was called, the name of the video is called Come to Zion. But here you go. Here's the stake center. And uh, this is essentially, I, I assume that when things actually happen, uh, that this would be the center stake, right? And the temple just right there. And then uh, the 24 temples over here. Okay, let's continue. Okay, but notice it says cities, not just one city, many cities. Now, let all who can coolly and deliberately dispose of their property come up and give of their substance to the poor, that the hearts of the poor may be comforted, and all may worship God together in holiness of heart. Come, brethren, come all of you. And I prophesy in the name of the Lord that the state of Illinois shall, be, shall become a great and mighty mountain, as a city set upon a hill that cannot be hid, and a great candle that giveth light to the world. The city of Nauvoo also shall become the greatest city in the whole world. 
Now, this is the part that the BYU paper was talking about, how that may have been a, a po- well, it was definitely a po- possibility if the prophet said it, but it doesn't seem like that has come into fruition, and that could be because of unworthiness. I don't know. Curse the man who says to his neighbor, you are a mean man because you do not believe as I do. I now invite all liberal-minded men to come up to Nauvoo and help to build the city of our God. Let me fix that. The city of our God. Uh, we are not greatly distressed, no, nor ever will be. This is the principle of pe- This is the principal place of gathering. Therefore, let the brethren begin to roll in like like clouds, and we will sell you lots if you are able to pay for them. And uh, of it not, you shall have them without money. And without price. The greater blessing is unto those who come in times of adversity. For many will come to us in times of prosperity that will stand at the corners of the streets saying the long pharisaical faces to those that come after them. Don't go near. Bro, bro, brother Joseph, don't go near the authorities of the, ch- of the church for they will, pick it, they will pick your pockets. They will rob you of all your money. Thus will they breed in our midst a spirit of dissatisfaction and distrust that will end in persecution and distress. Now, from this hour, bring everything you can, you can bring and build a temple unto the Lord, a house into unto the Almighty God of Jacob. We will build upon the top of this temple a great observatory, a great and high watchtower, and at the top thereof. We will suspend a tremendous bell uh, that when it is rung shall rouse the inhabitants of Fort Madison and wake up the people of Warsaw and sound in the ears of men in Carthage. So I'm assuming that these are like towns roundabout. Let's take a look. Nauvoo, Illinois. I'm just going to zoom out and see if I can see them. They may not exist anymore. I don't know. Or he could be, well, there, there's Carthage right there. Uh, I don't see any of those other towns. I, I don't know. They, again, they may not exist anymore. Or he could be referring to like, no, the, the bell is going to ring far, like metaphorically speaking, it's going to ring loud and uh, be heard really far. Uh, let's see, where's the temple? Where is it? There it is. Let's go here. And there is the watchtower. Have you ever thought of that as being a watchtower? The central spire right here. That's how he's referring to that. Um, let's, go, let's see if we can get a better angle. Yeah, I like that right there. Okay. Um, suspend a tremendous bell, then that when it is rung, okay, that all these places will hear it. Uh, then shall the poor be fed by the curious who shall come from all parts of the world to see this wonderful temple. Yea, I prophesy that pleasure parties will come from England to see the mammoth. Okay, because it's like big to see the mammoth, and like the queen of Sheba shall say the the half never was told them. Schoolhouses shall be built built here, and high schools shall be established, and the great men of the earth shall send their sons here to board while they are receiving their education among us, and even noblemen, noblemen shall crave the privilege of educating their their children with us, and these poor saints shall chink. In their pockets, the money of these proud men received from received from such as come and dwell with us. Now, I will say that even though that never happened in Nauvoo, uh, that does happen in the church. There are people that go to BYU or they come to Utah to study. Uh, Utah, it's brought in a lot of people. It's brought in a lot of people, and in regards to you know, kings and queens coming. 
Uh, remember what happened recently where we had, uh, let's see, I don't know if it was the king of all of Ghana or just a tribe in Ghana, but king, Ghana, Razband. Remember this? Let's see, I don't want to go to LDS Living. Let's do this one. Uh, Ga Mansi King visits church headquarters. And I've done a video where there have been so many people from around the world that have come to meet with uh, the leaders of the church. It has happened. Maybe not in the way that Joseph Smith was describing or how you picture it as he's talking, because in his view, it's going to be Nauvoo. And for all I know, who knows? Maybe that would have happened if it wasn't for certain circumstances. Who the heck knows? But there are people that come to Utah and Idaho and places like that for education um, that are not members of the church. And uh, But here you go. You have them here at General Conference, uh, a king. And I don't know if this is the first time that a, a king has attended G General Conference, but that's kind of interesting to think about, don't you think? Um, let's see. I wish I had like all the other stories pulled up, but let me do something really quick because there's always new people joining the channel and okay. Uh, let's see. World leaders. I can't remember what I titled it. Yeah. There's these two videos right here where I compiled so many different articles from the church news website in Deseret News of President Nelson during his time, all these people coming from all over the world, uh, not just political leaders, but religious leaders and so social leaders and different organizations and stuff like that. Um, and it's not just during President Nelson's time. Uh, you know, it's been for a while, but but especially there, I think there's been an uptick ever since President Nelson became prophet. So I'm going to put these two videos in the description below. I would encourage you to watch them to kind of like see just how many people have been in Salt Lake and have toured Temple Square and um, other church facilities like Welfare Square and the Conference Center and stuff like that. Uh, President Trump. Well, one of these, I can't remember which video, but in one of them it shows President Trump uh, touring Welfare Square, meeting with church leaders. So it is happening. Even though it's not happening in Nauvoo, it is happening at church headquarters. Okay, so uh, parties shall come from England to see the mammoth. And like, okay, I'm not, I already read all the way down to this. Um now, brethren, I obligate myself to build as great a temple as ever Solomon did, if the church will back me up. Moreover, it shall not impo impoverish any man, but enrich thousands. And I will prophesy that the time shall be when these saints shall ride proudly over the mountains of Missouri, and no Gentile dog nor Missouri dog shall dare lift a tongue against them, but will lick up the dust from beneath their feet. And I pray the Father that... Many here may realize this and see it with their eyes. And if it should be, and at this point he says, there's a note that says, stretching his hands toward the place, and in a melancholy tone that made all hearts tremble. So, he, so he's doing that, okay? So, and if it so be the will of God that I might live to behold that temple completed and finished from the foundation to the top stone, I will say, O oh Lord, it is enough. Lord, let my servant depart in peace, which is my earnest prayer in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And uh, I did did he live to see the completion of the Navi Temple? Let's see. Did I feel like he did? Smith lived to see the complete. Completion of the Nauvoo Temple. Uh, let's see. In June 1844, work on the temple stopped when the saints learned of the death of the prophet Joseph Smith. Within weeks, however, 
the building recommenced and even and even intensified as church members fervently worked to complete the structure in order to receive promised promised temple blessings. All right, so he did not live uh, to see it complete. Um, I wonder how complete it was. It was at least in progress, so he did get to see that. Um, and and you have to wonder, like, him doing this, stretch, stretching his hands toward the place, and in a melancholy tone that made all hearts tremble. I wonder if he had some kind of idea or knew, you know, his fate, and um, was hoping that he could just see the temple completed, and... Uh, but it, that wasn't the case. And, you know, who know who knows why that was? It, it may have been just the timing of the Lord, but it was finished. And that's the important part. And the saints did receive their endowments, which was important for them as they uh, were about to, after that, cross the plains. They needed additional glor- uh, protection, the glory of the Lord, angels to protect them, so on and so forth. But... You know, I don't, I don't know. Like, when you look at the entire context of this, it sounds like he's really... Well, he is talking about the redemption of all North and South America, so that would have been a pretty, probably far-out event in the future. Um, so, anyway, th- this, is, this is the context. This is the, the whole thing. That's the entire uh, sermon or discourse or whatever. And he mentions in it the Constitution being in trouble... And, um, yeah, and then this people will be the staff upon which the nation shall lean. So, okay, so there's that. So she recorded it, Martha did. Uh, Go over, please. Um, James Burgess, or Burgess, also wrote that down. Now... This is what uh, Brigham Young said. Okay, the signers of the Declaration of Independence and the framers of the Constitution were inspired from on high to do that work. Uh, do you, do you, well, I'm not going to... Okay. But was that which was given to them perfect, not admitting any addition, whatever? No. So the Constitution was not perfect. For if men know anything, they must know that the Almighty has never yet found a man in mortality that was capable at the first intimation, at the first impulse, to receive anything in a state of entire perfection. They laid the foundation, and it was for after generations to rear the superstructure upon it. It is a progressive, a gradual work. So you see that? And you see how the church right now is really fighting to preserve religious freedom, right? Which is part of the Constitution. And again, like I said, there was the the Council of 50, which was drafting a Constitution, which of course, would I'm sure, would have been based on the U.S. Constitution. That's something that I'll have to try and study and find out more about. Okay, if the framers of the Constitution and the inhabitants of the United States had walked humbly before God, who defended them and fought their battles when Washington was on the stage of action, the nation would now have been free from a multitude of place hunters who live upon its vitals. The country would not have been overrun with murderers and thieves in our cities filled with houses of ill fame as now, and men could have walked the streets of cities or traveled on conveyances through the, through the country without being insulted, plundered, and perhaps murdered. And an honest, sober, industrious, enterprising, and righteous people would now have been found from one end of the United States to the other. So that's how he viewed the country at that time, and I'm sure many others did as well. So that's kind of interesting, you know, because we know the United States has been an incredible country. And generally, you know, at at times, mostly um, a righteous country, if you take everyone all together. Um, But it's interesting what he's saying here, you know, 
God made it possible for the United States to become a nation. He guided it. He gave the foundation of a constitution, but not a constitution in its perfection. Uh, it, and like he says, it's a progressive, gradual work. Okay. But, um, yeah, it, it just the world is messed up. And um, we're not righteous enough, not as a church, not as a nation. Um, hopefully, the church right now, in 2023, hopefully it's getting more righteous, or at least the the five wise virgins. Okay. Anyway, continuing his talk about the United States, he says, The whole body is deranged, and the head, which ought to be the seed of sense and the temple of wisdom, is insensible to the wants of the body, and to the fact that if the body sinks, the head must sink also. I want to tell a political anecdote. Or at least I will tell it so nigh that you will guess the whole of it. Two fellows were stump speaking for office in the state of Illinois. One of them was a lawyer of flowery, eloquent speech, and the other was a rough and ready homespun mechanic, but a man of sound sense. The lawyer made his speech in flaming language, uh, interlarding it would interlarding it with expressions of sensitive regard for the people's interests. The mechanic mounted the rostrum and says he, I cannot make a speech to cope with this man's speech, but I can tell you uh, what he and I want. He wants your votes. Now, if you'll give me your votes, then I will get into the office. I will get into office. You may and be damned. They both felt so and they and there are but few exceptions to this practice. Office seekers are full of tricks and intrigues of every kind to get in office. And then the people may and be damned. The progress of revolution is quite considerable in every government of the world. But is the revolution for the constitutional rights of the people in progress? No, it is on retrograde. I know this is Brigham Young talking uh, all the way back then. I know how they can be brought back to the people and the government be redeemed to become one of the most powerful and best on earth. It was instituted in the beginning by the Almighty. He operated upon the hearts of the revolutionary fathers to rebel against the English king and his parliament, as he does upon me to preach Mormonism. Both are inspired by him, but the work unto which they are called is dissimilar. The one was inspired to fight the other to preach the peaceful things of the kingdom of God. He operated upon the pusillan... What? Pusillanimous... Pusillanimous king to excite... The, that's an amazing word. He operated upon that king to excite the colonists to rebellion... And he is still operating with this nation and taking away their wisdom until by and by they will get mad and rush to certain destruction. Will the Constitution be destroyed? No. It will be held inviolate, inviolate by this people. And as Joseph said, quote, the time will come when the destiny of the nation will hang upon a single thread that at that critical juncture, this people will step forth and save it from the threatened destruction. End quote. It will be so. Okay, so according to, to Brigham Young, this is still, still a future event. Um, okay, with regard to the doings of our fathers in the Constitution of the United States, I have to say, they present to us a glorious prospect in the future, but we cannot attain to it but we cannot attain to until the present abuses in government are corrected. So we have a glorious prospect in the future, but we can't get to it until the abuses in government are corrected. And I'm not so sure that they have. In fact, I think it's probably just gotten worse since that time. Um, you have heard our judge relate an incident which is only one more among numberless abuses perpetrated by the rulers of the nation. The particulars of this incident can be found upon our dockets, showing that the President of the United States assumes to himself power to remove a circuit judge. I'm not a lawyer, but I wish to propound a question. 
by what law, constitutional or statute, has the president a right to remove a United States judge except for illegal conduct or inability? It is, to say the least, a flagrant assumption of power. What business, what business have they thus to remove our judges? What end have they in view? I tell you, it is tickle me, tickle me, oh, Billy do, and in your turn, I'll tickle you. (laughs) So that's what the president has up his sleeve. Um, Tickle me, tickle me, oh, Billy do, and in turn, I'll tickle you. (laughs) Oh, gosh. Okay. All right, and then to end on a positive note, this was said recently by President Down H. Oaks. He himself was a judge. He was a Supreme Court uh, or Utah Supreme Court justice. Um, he has a strong, deep legal background, and he talks a lot about laws and the Constitution and such. And this is what he said in the April 2021 General Conference. Our belief in divine inspiration gives Latter-day Saints a unique responsibility to uphold and defend the United States Constitution and principles of constitutionalism wherever we live. We should trust in the Lord and be positive about this nation's future. And that's something that, like I've said before, I haven't seen a lot of people do. I feel like a lot of people read the Joseph Smith uh, prophecy and they, they focus on the doom and gloom and fear and bleakness of uh, the condition of the country when it gets to that point. And I would argue, like I've said before, you know, we've always had secret combinations, Gadiat and robbers, people trying to uh, gain and maintain worldly power and... Uh, these people, one of their biggest victories, in my opinion, was when they uh, took out this person. Right. Uh, and he spoke about that. And, uh, you know, I think that that was. I feel like that was like a milestone um, of sorts for the for the Gadiat and robbers when they accomplished this. Because being able to do this uh, to, to the person in this office, uh, that's kind of a, yeah, that, that would probably be really motivating if you're on that side. The ones that, you know, um, did this, you know, to, to him. So, I don't know. But that that's what I have so far. And I, I the feeling that I get... Now, I mean, Down H. Oaks here, he's talking in kind of a broad sense. And not just the United States, but the entire world. At this point, most countries uh, have a constitution. And it's based on uh, the principles of the American constitution. So it, it's now not just a United States thing. It, it's throughout the world. And... Um, It's everybody's duty to uphold it, defend it, and especially when it comes to uh, religious freedom. So I'm going to see if I can find more. I know there's been a lot said about the Constitution uh, in general conference and stuff like that. So I'll see what I can find. And again, like I said, if you have uh, stuff that you can share with me, then uh, send it my way. See, go like that. Go like that. That's pretty good. Um, but I think that's going to be it for this one. So now we we kind of have like the foundation of where this idea comes from. Not too sure about when it's going to be fulfilled, how, or anything like that. But we might get some more clues as we uh, find some more quotes from other general authorities. But uh, that's going to be it for this one. Um. 
I, I would take President Oak's advice and be positive about the future. I think that the future is bright. Um, I have, get rid of this. I have one of these rows called Future is Bright. And that is something that they are definitely communicating to us. That doesn't mean that everything's going to be roses, you know. But like I said, the judgments have been on the earth since the dedication of the, the Salt Lake Temple, when Wilfred Woodruff said that the four angels of the Book of Revelation had been released from their portals. It's been happening. There's been lots of stuff that's happened. Just review <clears throat> review my timeline here. I include natural disasters, wars, riots, uh, pandemics, and other major things. It's The world's been in turmoil for a long time, you know. And we know that one of those key moments was uh, the Civil War, the American Civil War, and everything that's taken place since that time. So we're already living in it. We're already living in it. Be uh, positive about the future. Have optimism. Don't bring other people down. Uh, do be prepared. You know, have some, uh, have an emergency plan. Have 72 hour kits. That's what, what we have. Have food store, storage. That's what we have. Um, and it's not, I don't think it's necessary, but it's not a bad idea if you can get some property and raise some of your own animals and have a garden like what we're doing. Um, and yeah. Okay, well that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.